structural engineer. Gary's going to tell us a little bit about that. But first, we want to thank you all for watching us on Facebook Live, Spotify, Twitch, and YouTube. Tell your friends, please, to share, follow, subscribe, and uh, just like our program here. Uh, Marty Winkle, my co-producer, and he is working the Streamlabs Engineering Studio there. Marty, this is our 532nd episode, Gary. Okay. Born out of the pandemic, we wanted to reach out to schools and maybe give them an inside tour of the museum, and it ends up being what our museum's all about. The, the uh, homage, if you will, to the space workers like yourself and Marty that we truly consider national treasures. Uh, Gary, you've been involved with this museum a while, but tell our Stay Curious listeners up there where you're from and how you got here. Okay, we're originally uh, from St. Louis, Missouri. I went to a small college outside of St. Louis, and uh, NASA came to our campus one day, and it, we were, got the interview with them, and the next thing I knew, I had an offer to come back here to Kennedy at Space Center in Florida. And so three weeks after I graduated, I showed up here at Kennedy. Really? What yes. was your family like? You, you, the oldest, youngest. I mean, that'd uh, be exciting for your family to think, "Hey, he's got a job. Not well, only a, good, a real job, he's got a good job." <laughs> they were quite surprised that I was going to move out of St. Louis and, and move away from the home. I do have one brother who's still in St. Louis, uh-huh. and uh, most of my family at the time all worked for McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis, in the <laughs> aircraft act, you know, industry, and I decided that I was going to kind of break free. And uh, so I came down, uh, got married, and my wife cried all the way here. <laughs> she did. <laughs> yes, and she didn't realize I was going to be moving down here, but she was so happy that we did finally did, did that. We've been living in Titusville for over 50 years. Wow. And uh, one of our, well, I don't know, we'll have to, we'll put you maybe our second favorite person to come from St. Louis because <laughs> Lowell Grissom is a friend of oh, our really? museum and you know Lowell probably. No, I don't. Well, Gus Grissom's brother. Oh, okay. And he was a McDonald uh, kind of a public relations guy uh, there uh, in, in St. Louis. Louis. But uh, he comes here every January and, and partakes in the services oh, to okay. his, uh, his brother and the Columbian Challenger people. So, uh, yeah, I like St. Louis people, good people. Uh, I've been up in the arch and all that kind of stuff. Oh, all right. Good, good fun. Gary's got a story for us today on Stay Curious. We're going to focus. He's done many things, all right? Uh, uh, briefly tell us what your career was as a structural engineer. We're going to focus on the Apollo era of Gary's career, though he had an illustrious uh, uh, stint with the Apollo Soyuz test project and then into the shuttle. But uh, tell us what you started doing, and we're going to be seeing a lot of great pictures that you haven't seen in a while. Okay. Here we've got, of course, the mighty Saturn V behind us, because we're going to be talking next month is the 50th anniversary of Apollo 16 going to the moon with That's John right. Young and uh, Charlie Duke walking on the moon while Ken Mattingly orbited. Okay. And uh, though you said you didn't specifically work on that mission, Gary's going to take us through kind of the whole process of the command module in the middle of the shuttle, putting it on this stack. Okay. Well, when I started with NASA, I had the option to either work in a launch vehicle, interviewing with them, or, or the spacecraft. And I decided to go to the spacecraft and never made it to the launch vehicle. And when we got interviewed them, uh, we would go through different sections, and then finally I decided to stay with the mechanical s structure section of that. So we, we had the responsibility for all the mating operations of the spacecraft mm -hmm. and then the buildup of all the equipment inside. And uh, to begin with, the spacecraft would be delivered to us by airplane, the pregnant gu guppy. We're going to see a picture or two okay. of that in a minute. And then we would bring it into our facility, which was located three, three miles south of the VAV complex. Mm -hmm. And we had a building in, uh, in that building, we had a high bay and a low bay. The high bay was where we kept the spacecraft, and it was in. It had two altitude chambers in there, very large altitude chambers. We're going to see pictures of those oh, too. Yeah. And mean. the spacecraft <clears throat> the command module and the service module would be put into that particular uh, air uh, airlock. I mean, air uh, altitude chamber, and it would spend the whole time in it there. It never came out until we were ready to take it to the VAB. Wow! And then the lunar module was in the low bay area, and it came in two sections. 
and it stayed, uh, it didn't stay very long in the altitude chamber. It only did the, we did two major runs in the altitude chamber with the crew. Most of the, you know, they only came twice to the altitude chamber. And what during they, the whole program. During, so. during the whole program. Now Marty Winkle, of course, was a Grumman guy working yeah. on that ascent and descent yes. stage there. Marty, were you ever involved in the altitude chamber? Yeah. Yep, yeah. he was. Okay. okay. And then the uh, the first major test that we would do after we had put the command module onto the service module and tied it down is that we would do a docking test with the ascent stage of the lunar module. And what Grumman would do is they would take the lunar module ascent stage and they would flip it over upside yeah, we're gonna down. We're going to see a picture of that too yeah. here in a minute. Upside down and then they would lift it over to it, over our chamber and lower it down and we would do an actual docking with the lunar module to the with the hardware module, with the okay. hardware with the docking probe and the latches and then the astronauts two of the astronauts would be there the commander and the uh, lunar pilot would be in to participate in that and then for the after that would they be inside the ascent stage they were inside no th no nobody was inside the ascent yeah, yeah. stage you mm -hmm. couldn't well, we're gonna see a picture of that let's talk about that when we get to that you point. cannot walk <laughs> I mean, you can't touch that thing oh right that. yeah because it's one six gravity yeah. everything's built yes. like that in so. there. Uh, we're talking with gary allgaier here that's a structural engineer as you see uh that he was not allowed to touch the technicians did the touch in there you were like the blueprint guy then Engineers, all we did was we would supervise and tell the technicians what to do. Okay. And then they would touch it. We were not allowed to touch hardware. Hmm. Well, we're going to look at a couple pictures okay. here. I wanted to mention that we've had a blessed day here at our museum. We had over 100 <clears throat> students and their chaperones come to us from the St. Petersburg, Clearwater area over there on the West Coast, almost a three hour drive here. Uh, filled up to the gills here in, in, in our museum. and. Uh, I helped here in the museum. We had six docents, and I went over to Space View Park and uh, uh, at our beautiful Apollo monument and shuttle monuments and uh, talked to the kids over there, too. So we just got been here in our studios, our Hyatt Place studios here at the American Space Museum in downtown Titusville. Uh, Gary, I met him uh, earlier this week, and uh, he said he's a snowbird. He's going to... Uh, a reverse snowbird back to where are you going? Blairsville, Georgia. Blairsville, Georgia, <laughs> for those of you that know that. And so we're glad to catch you here and come in. And you're going to see this gentleman again because he's got a lot to share. Uh, and he's pulled a lot of fascinating pictures here. So let's get into this a little bit. And Marty, if we got some comments and so forth, that'd be fine. Uh, what are we looking at here? This is uh, after the Apollo 17, the astronauts signed some documentation and they sent it to all the people at uh, KSC that participated on the uh, moon missions and this is just a kind of a memento that we got to have and we can put you know it was it was hanging up on a wall but I've got it down now so well they type your name in there yeah. and it's to certify an expression of our sincere appreciation for your dedication efforts which enabled us to take another step towards man's continuing conquest of space and that's the crew of Gemini or Apollo 17, Gene Cernan, Ron Evans, and Harrison Schmidt, of which only Harrison Schmidt is still with us. Uh, one of four moonwalkers still alive, mm -hmm. and I've had the privilege of, of meeting. Uh, this was interesting. Uh, Gary put together all those who worked with me. All right, and Marty's going to circle a few people there that we know from our museum. And Gary, you're up. You're uh, there's Charlie Mars. Our godfather, hi Charlie, under the Lunar Module Engineering Division. We see Bob Seek is there, uh, uh, who's going to be speaking at our April 16th event. Uh, Norm Carlson's up there at the top, a uh, fabled, uh, uh, famous guy, uh, most famous for his uh, beans or go, I think. In yes, the it was. Yes, it did. Yes, yeah. he served as up to every launch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and then over there in the center there, you're, you're uh, pretty half the food chain there. Uh, yeah. Uh, Gary, Gary Allgaier there. Uh, so, uh, yeah, look at all those people. You were talking a little bit about some of those people well, there. Uh, a lot we were, of memories there. You're looking back 50 years yeah. of friendship and hard work. That's right. And we were, what we were doing, we had, uh, there was three lead engineers that worked the Apollo spacecraft, and then we had two lead engineers that worked at Lunar Module in our office. Mm -hmm. And then as a newbie, a new hiree, I was assigned to one of those engineers, which is Jimmy Hankartner. 
and then we had John Link was another one. So we we supported those and uh, for oh, quite a few years. I, t I didn't come a lead until ASDP. Quite a few years is right. There yeah. you are, huh? Yeah, that's when I was young. That's when we were all young, man. I'll tell yeah. you there. Uh, rocking a nice mustache yeah, there, yeah. and uh, yeah. uh, you're a motorcycle buff. Were you into Harley Davidsons back then? Oh no, I was into racing dirt bikes. Ray, okay, okay. So. There's a phone like we have in our museum. <laughs> as a we have a phone like that actually in our museum as a museum yeah. piece, a rotary dial we, phone. We were talking the other day with some <laughs> some other friends that uh, well, we were saying we were the uh, the years where we used slide rules and I can still remember when Texas uh, Hewlett Packard brought out the TI 35 of the course. first handheld calculator and a lot of us said well we need to go back to school so we can utilize this a couple yeah. hundred dollars yes they now you were. turn around every dollar general and they're yes. six bucks so yeah you know, yeah there. but they were amazing machines at back that time they sure were yeah. uh, and uh, uh, I wanted to mention as we're looking at Gary here a little bit younger Gary Algeyer yeah. Gary it's uh, uh, there was a lot of young people like yourself that took us to the moon in nine years and when you look at the SpaceX Hawthorne launch control Hawthorne California launch control and people involved and you're going to meet a guest tomorrow that's a European Space Agency uh, guest we have coming uh, uh, they're young people just like it's, it's 50 years later it's like deja vu all over again there's no gray hair in these launch controls well it is that's a little uh, deceiving because uh, myself and another gentleman two gentlemen that came in after me we were the youngest ones we were, we were in our okay. age we were 22 when we came to work there and all of the people that been there they came off of the mercury or gemini program okay so all of the my leads were all you know ex some of them already passed away they were already in their late 30s, maybe our 40s, mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when we met up with them. Who are you there with? You both got I, your pocket protectors in your <laughs> shirt and yes. rocking the wide belts? Okay, Mike Wiedemann, that's Mike Wiedemann, and he he worked for the contractor, which at the time was North American Aviation. It did, then came North American Aviation, Rockwell, when Rockwell uh, mm -hmm. bought North American Aviation. And eventually, it, was, it just came Rockwell. Okay. And you'll see Rockwell later in the in the, pro the Apollo program and then basically in the shuttle program. Now, of course, space lovers know that that is the uh, the protective cover over an oh, Apollo yes, module yeah. with the escape hatch on it, but where is the location of this? Okay, we're out at the pad A, and this is... Uh, You're on the pad. Yes, we're on the pad, and this set pitches were taken normally about the last time we could have access to the pad. Okay. And uh, at that one time, we got... Uh, Mike and I got locked out. Uh, oh, really? They, they uh, well, they they sent all the text down, and then they had an early uh, clear with pad, and so it was a, the pad leader, Mike and myself. We had to finish putting that together. And that's the only time I ever got to touch flight hardware, and uh, right. so that was kind of a fun day. Fun day which, for uh, us. Which which uh, uh, spacecraft was this? You remember? I them? don't remember. They okay. all start. You know, a lot of them start coming together. You know. Well, here you are with the uh, the fourth man on the moon, or no, uh, he'd be the sixth man on the moon, mm -hmm. Edgar Mitchell, who was a great friend of our museum, as you were. You you had a lot. You were a lot involved with our museum. Uh, back 10 years ago, Edgar Mitchell died in 2016. Oh, he did? Oh. Uh, I looked it up, yes, and uh, there you are with the Apollo module. And I brought this Apollo model here just in case we want to talk about a few things here, uh, at point two. But uh, uh, talk about, you were involved with Space View Park, putting it together, uh, helping raise money and so forth like that, and Edgar Mitchell was one of the astronomers that was really behind our museum. Speak about him and your involvement there, please. Well, the only time I really got to meet, as far as engineers, we didn't get a lot of face time with the astronauts. Uh, we could see them when they come in, and we just kind of stayed away from them, let them do their job, and didn't didn't try to interfere. Ask you know, didn't ask for autographs or anything like that. So this is the first time I actually got to meet up close uh, to Ed Mitchell. I met uh, 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 a couple of other ones, Sally Ride. I got to talk to her. And I got to talk to Anazuka because mm -hmm. uh, I worked on one of his missions on the shuttle. But uh, he was a very great gentleman, and like I told you, I have the two interview clips. Of yes, we've got uh, you've got some interviews with yeah. uh, 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 
uh, Edgar Mitchell there. Yeah. Edgar Mitchell, quite a character in many ways. He did some ESP experiments on the on the moon, mm -hmm. and then came back and founded the Noetic Institute for Paranormal yeah. Activities. <clears throat> uh, uh, but I uh, wish I, Karen Conklin, our executive director, of course, yeah. knew him pretty well. He helped the museum quite yeah. a bit there in the beginning there. So, well, good. We want to get. Uh, we got some pretty pictures of Saturn rocket here. Uh, threw some of these in there because we've got the Artemis rocket on pad 39B that is a little bit, a uh, uh, little bit smaller, but it's, it's going to be more powerful because the SRBs it has on it there. Yes. Yeah. And uh, but when we look at these pictures, you go all the way up at the top of the gantry there, and this is where you and Marty did work in in these areas up there. And then we got to show you the. This, of course, is for the uh, Skylab and the, um, uh, yep, up there's where he's showing you where Marty and yourself would go to work on the, uh, the, the spacecraft. They put the Skylab on a S1B, or S4B, I mean, and put a milk stool, they called it up there, yeah. instead of moving everything down to the lower level. It was smarter to move stuff up, I guess. Well, norm yeah, that's what they did. Normally, they would have, you know, this that particular vehicle launched off of pad 34 on the Air Force side. And I don't know whether the pad had been vacant for f f since uh, basically yeah. Apollo 7. And it was easier for them to go ahead and put it, they called the milk stool, uh, and raise it up so that the swing arms would match up with the third state, well, yeah. the, S4B, you know, <clears throat> the S4B, and which was had the Skylab in it. And then the spacecraft, the swing arm nine and swing arm eight. I mean, these are things that you're in a me in a meeting in a meeting with a bunch of engineers, and someone says, "You know what? Let's just build a big old yeah. milk stool and put it on there." And, and you're <laughs> like, everyone's going, "Do you know how heavy that thing is?" You know, but yeah. <laughs> da da. Yeah, they did it. It worked. Yeah. Uh, there's another view uh, of it. Uh, where uh, there's the command module. Gary's got a lot of pictures of structural stuff here. The command module that will enlighten you and that's there just to take the skin off of it to show you how complex it is particularly the docking probe up there we're going to see some attention to today okay. and we're going to look at this the, this, this is the service module and uh, it contains uh, the, the main fuel tanks for the main engine that uh, was that which would put them in orbit around the moon and take them and kick them out of orbit back to the United to the, the <clears throat> earth and then there's a fuel cells and then the oxygen tanks and hydrogen tanks. Now the service module for the Artemis Orion is built by the European Space Agency and we're going to hear about that tomorrow okay. uh, from our guest. Uh, Rock Keat will be our guest tomorrow. Okay. Uh, and that's looking... That's looking down on it and it shows you the, the two different uh, fuels that they're using. They're using a, a, a hypergolic fuel system where the two fuels just when they meet each other they, they automatically combust. Yes. So Apollo 13 mm -hmm. got into trouble because the shaded, it was one of the oxidizers? No, it was, a, it was an oxygen tank okay. and I have a picture of that I think it's right. later. Um, the oxygen tanks are above and the I so the round the, silver is the oxygen tank up there. Yeah, and there's a high either. Well, I'd have to look at another drawing, but there's um, there, these are two hydrogen tanks and two oxygen tanks in there to provide the fuel for the fuel cells. Now, why do we need all of that aluminum foil? In That's there? the insulation to keep the compartment. Uh, of course, it wasn't aluminum temperature. foil. It was. It's basically a, a real fancy aluminum foil. It's okay. very very thin. It's called mylar, and. Uh, we right. use that throughout the whole space program. We still use it on the right. shuttle. Right, it, it turned yeah. turned out to be yes. the, the very way. good insulator. Okay. It's built up of layers. Okay. Okay. And here's the here's two of the three fuel cells. Okay. Now these fuel cells were very pioneering in the Gemini era. To quickly tell us what a fuel cell does. Well, fuel cell takes hydrogen and oxygen and combines them, and the by to make they uh, generate electricity from that combining those two elements. And then the bypass, I mean, uh, the side thing that you get out of it is you get water. Mm -hmm. And then they could use that for drinking water. And that become important in the space shuttle where they actually become smaller, as you said. They really reduce the size for the space shuttle. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we had to replace those fuel cells quite often. They, they had a, a lifetime 
t run time, and several times we exceeded that, so we had to pull, pull a fuel cell and put a new one in. That, this is a real, though, uh, this replaced batteries. So this yes. was a real breakthrough in the space program, wasn't it? Yes, it, it was. It was a very advantage. They didn't have to have solar panels. Right. No solar panels creating yeah. fuel this way. Yeah. Well, <coughs> what do we have there? We have a pregnant guppy, and I think it's delivering a... Uh, it could be. I can't really tell service from this picture. Module. Pardon? Service module? It, it could be a service module. Yes, this is... This landed on the Air Force side of the Cape, and then they would transport it over. Yeah, they're bringing out a service model. Now, super this is, Guppy there, it yeah, says. Super Guppy, yeah. That's where the pilots are, where they separate that. Yeah. Those of you that aren't familiar with this very strange but efficient airplane. Right. And this is a SLAW. S-L-A. Uh, spacecraft to Lunar adapt ap Adapter. Spacecraft, spacecraft Lunar Aft Adapter. adapter. Right, okay, yeah. slaw. Slaw, and it's separated. You can see the separation plane. And that's where it covered the lunar module, right Correct. below the command module. It's and the, the top of the lunar module was a foot away from that bell of the engine, Marty? It was pretty close, weren't they? The, the, uh, the, the, the command module uh, exhaust was almost right on top of the... The service module. Yeah. Yeah, the service module well, exhaust the, the was right service on top. Module, the service module, the engine bell, the lunar module. engine bell was, was on top, was of, on top of that. And there's another. This, this is a this is a, a lunar module element that's coming into being delivered. Oh, LM3 to the it says yeah. right on it. So that would have been. Uh, that's a flight article. Now this is really a cool picture. There. This is, uh, I think it's Apollo Seven air, spacecraft is hanging there, and Apollo Eight uh, is coming in the door. Wow. It's a service module, it's horizontal, and then you have the crew module. And then the engine bell has not been installed, nor the high gain antenna has been installed on the one that's hanging from the crane. Mm -hmm. This is in the high bay area of the building. And this is a picture of me. This is You're on the left there, there. Gary on the left. And we're, we're lowering a service module onto a support ring. And the gold things that you see hanging there are radiators. When we go to altitude uh, in the chamber on a test, the heat from the radi from the radiators on the service module generate a lot of heat, and these absorb those at heat, so it doesn't uh, overheat the whole you know, chamber. Those are cooling plates. No, that's in the altitude chamber. This also. is in the altitude chamber. The lid is off. It has a big, huge lid that they take off when they need to lower or raise anything out of the chamber. Quickly tell everyone what the altitude chamber is. Altitude chamber had, was a chamber where we could pump down. They had huge pumps down in the basement, and they would pull a vacuum on the chamber. They're creating outer space yeah, yeah, outer on space. Earth. Yeah, they're creating uh, with no no temperature and everything. And no, not temperature. Not it was te just, just it was just a, just atmosphere. Just I was uh, wondering about pressure, the pressurized. No, okay. they did, they didn't cool it down. And it just uh, pulled a vacuum on it, and they would do it. They would did two runs uh, for altitude. One we would do one without the crew. Then the second one we would have the crew come in. The full crew would come in and participate in the altitude chamber test. They would close it. They'd pull the vacuum, and then they would go through a bunch of testing. And what would you learn from that, Gary? One is the the, the unit would work in, in on orbit. That okay. was the main thing. But it was just. Because you're 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 creating a space environment without the the heat factor or, or, yes, or cold they factor. Do. Cold so factor. it's a vacuum of space yeah. to make sure everything works. And that was the big thing when we went to shuttle. We couldn't do that anymore. Oh right, you can put the whole build, yeah. not big so enough building. They only yeah. did one pressure check on the first on Columbia in a chamber, but that was it. Just uh -huh. this, this the unit itself, not a, not as a built up shuttle. So that was the biggest one of the big changes that we had to get used to without having to do this for every flow. And that's a word, flow. That That's yeah. a key word in what you did. You were a flow director or a flow, talk, talk about that. Well, I'm what, a, what are we seeing here? Okay, well, what we're seeing here is the CSM uh, umbilical. This is where the fluid lines from the service module that go to the crew compartment for either drink water or for cooling, and then also all your electronics from the service module to the command module. This is where they all came together. And there's a big guillotine. It's inside. It doesn't show up. 
and when they get ready to re-enter the atmosphere, they have a, they fire the ordnance, and it just cuts everything, just like. Mm. And uh, it, very it, similar it, to on the ascent descent engine of uh, the lunar module. Yeah. They had a and then it, it'll, it'll fold back out of the way, and then they fire. There's three. There's only three attach points for the service module and the command module. There's wow. six. There's six pads, but three are just compression pads where we sat on them. But the other three had bolts with. We had front flangible nuts, and they would fire that nut. And then he also had a guillotine that cut the. Uh, the bolt in half so it didn't stick out so far. Three connection points yeah. to the service module which of course is the the, yeah. the, the round cylinder beneath the, yes. the the command module cone there. Yes. Well I interrupted the flow talk on this picture this picture here. Talk, speak of the uh, the word flow in your your, well, your business flow is, here. is more uh, related to the we call the operations group where they control the flow from the when it first gets there to we launch mm -hmm. and they have it all and they have it all set up, mapped out. Every item that we ever work is charted that we do, and they keep a daily, so they had a 72-hour schedule with everything on that schedule they would put on a blackboard, and they would follow it. Okay, that's what we want. Yeah. And now you're staying curious and know out there. Mm -hmm. uh, Marty, you can give me any time, our wonderful watchers out there, I can pipe yeah. some in, because I'll bet many of them have never seen a blue command module. What's up with that, Gary? Well, it's the t covering of this tape. When they pull that tape off, that blue tape, it's silver. Okay, but this is how it's shipped to KSC That's how it's from shipped uh, in, yes. Downey, uh, California. In, in California, now, North Carolina. Not all of the Apollo spacecraft were had the silver tape on them. Wow. Only the ones that was going to moon. I think Apollo 7 had it, but it, for ASTP, they were just painted. Well, we have got watching uh, Bob Swain from Swan. Bob Swan from Adairsville, Georgia. All right, Marty says hi to Bob. Okay, you know Bob, I guess, huh, Marty? Hi, Bob. Marty says Paul Forrester, Jason Cristofoli is oh. watching. Tom Usiak and and Mark Usiak are two uh, brothers in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, hoping to thaw out this weekend. I think <laughs> going to get warm there. Uh, Dave Stangy, hi Dave, he's in Michigan. Carlton Bailey's just down the road here in Coco. Uh, and uh, Cynthia Rossi, uh, hello to everybody yeah. there. We've got people, I haven't said hi to you, Robert Law, in a while, buddy. I have, we're not ignoring <clears throat> you, but Robert Law is in Dundee, Scotland. He's got a, a six foot big TV he's watching us oh, on okay. in uh, his home in Dundee, Scotland there. So, uh, and Ophelia is watching us, uh, we, Ophelia's in Normandy, France. Oh. So we've got people in, uh, I, probably on, we've had people on six continents watch us, I think, because I know Africa, Australia, uh, and Europe have been in there, of course. So we appreciate everybody watching us. Here's another little trip down memory lane with Gary Allgaier, NASA structural engineer. He also had a lot to do with the space shuttle program, but uh, we want, we're going to bring Gary back uh, when he comes back this uh, uh uh, fall down here. So Gary, what's what are we looking at there? Okay, we've come out of the altitude chamber and then it sits in another stand and then uh, we install the, the engine bell which is on here now and also you can see the high gain antenna off of it. It's in a stowed position. Uh -huh. And then if from there it goes and we set it on top of the slaw and do the physical bolting it down to the slaw. Hmm. And then from there it goes out to the VAB. Uh, what what strikes me is all of the equipment that was built, test stands and so forth. That that's a whole other engineering side of, of, of space rockets and building stuff. Is you have to have some elaborate stands and so forth to to do oh, all yes. this, right? Yes, and we have a design engineering group. That's all they did was design all these facilities and whatever hardware we needed, uh, they would build it. Huh. And here's a picture of it, of mating it to the slaw. And, and bear in mind there, we're going to see a few pictures here in a, a minute, but uh, the lunar modules below there, and uh, that bell of the service module engine just, uh, Marty, I didn't, uh, how, how far are they separated by? Not much? Okay. 
There, that's a cool picture. This is at the pad. You're getting ready to roll back the, the what we call them, a mobile service structure. This is what gave us the access to we could work on this spacecraft. And then you can see the white room there. The famous the red gantry uh, yes. that the astronauts walked yes. out to. And then that's swing arm eight and then swing arm nine. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, that's eight right here and a nine up there. Yeah. One of the interesting things, occasionally I had to take one of the... Marty, the white room's up there in the upper left, yep, as left, you can yes. see there. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, there's the white room That's there. the white room. And then so the other gantry eight is part, uh, that's tied into the service structure. That there. provided us air to, we had to blow air across the top of the service module because the fuels generated heat on our own. And to keep them cool, we would, we would uh, blow air down on them. And the problem we, that we had, and we were in the room and everything's closed up, they had to flow 100 pounds of air a minute through an orifice that was about seven inches in, in a square. And wow. when it when it went did that, it went supersonic. Really? Yes. And it was so loud that the only way we could communicate was to walk up to the individual, cup our hands over our mouth, and put it up to your ear, and yell and scream as loud as you could. Like, yes, yes. Really? So we had to do that. We talked to safety and uh, to say, you know, we we just can't survive out here because you're going to go deaf. And right. uh, they weren't very supportive. But what they ended up doing is they would not load the fuel and they would not do the air when we were around. It was after later in the count. That's a fascinating thing to yes. know about the Apollo program yes. there. Here, uh, where are we at here? Now this is back at the, we, we call the O&C building. We had two small control rooms there. Our operations and checkout, which is yeah, now the Neil yeah. Armstrong Museum that Marty loves reminding me. It was called the MSOB. Well, it started out, when I first came, it was called the SOB, Spacecraft <laughs> Operations okay. Building. All right, Spacecraft and Operations Building. So somebody finally figured out that's not a good acronym for, <laughs> for that. I guess not. So they put the M in front of it. All right. And so they went to the M, you know, Manned Spacecraft Operations Building. And after a while, they said, well, that's still not good enough. So they made it, they just named it Operation Control, ONC. And then they finally named it Neil Armstrong Operations yes, Control. Yes, just a couple years ago. There. But these are two. We we had a control room in this, and uh, the, the, the lunar module had their control room. These are the guys in my office uh, that I worked with. This is a stage picture. We were never in this room because uh -huh. we didn't have any. You know, we had just mechanical stuff. We didn't have any electrons or charts or anything like that. So. Uh, they came down one day with a cameraman and said, hey, we want you all over here, and we're going to take a picture. And I'm up at the... At the uh, You're up at the top in the yeah, middle there. Yeah, yeah. he's in the middle there, so, Marty, yeah. with the headset so, on there. So You still have that headset? It's probably worth a couple hundred dollars. No, I don't option. have... There's a lot of things I don't have, and I wish I had... A, you know, back then we could have uh, cell phones. I would have had a lot of good pictures. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. Well, we're going to got a couple... We're, we're enjoying a conversation with Gary Allgaier here. He's a structural engineer for NASA. How many years did you put in, Gary? 33. 33 years. All right. Okay. And uh, we hope that you're all enjoying this. Marty Winkle, who worked on Grumman, a lunar module, same time Gary was working on... This is on the command module side there. Uh, you got any questions, Marty? Anybody have any good questions or comments today? What are we looking at there, Gary? This is one of the pads that uh, supports the command module and the service module. This is a compression pad. Really? It just sits on it, and it, I don't have a picture of the other three. Uh, so there's three of these and then three th latch points yes. that, that are connecting so the for service a total, module. It's for a total of six. Wow. <clears throat> of course, everybody knows that's looking inside the yeah. CM. This is, yeah, this is on, on our, but this is a Apollo 9. Actually, picture was taken of Apollo 9. Okay. Uh, in the side hatch, and I think we have a little bit closer one of that. Uh, there's Rusty Schweiker, Schweiker in there. Yes, and yeah. there's a picture of the hatch. Now I got to meet the man, uh, Earl Holman was the designer of that new hatch. Okay, after the Apollo 1 fire, they had to completely yes. redesign the hatch because it took almost 60 seconds to open the old hatch, mm -hmm. and uh, they needed to. Uh, Took uh, more than that. Well, yeah, it the, took more than that. Well, yeah. what it ended up, actually, there's three hatches too. There was three, but the problem was, and it is based, you know, from Gus Grissom's uh, second suborbital flight when the hatch blew off the Mercury capsule, un, unbeknown, and 
And uh, of course, he, you know, he almost drowned and uh, they, they couldn't recover it. So the astronauts were always afraid of hatch opening in, in flight. Especially if you're halfway to the moon, then the hatch would open. So, um, <laughs> yeah, that wouldn't be good. It wouldn't be good. So, Earl Holman was a design engineer at Downey, California, from uh, Rockwell, one of the best engineers that I ever came across, and he designed this. And um, it's 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 very complicated, but uh, it worked, and we never we had a few issues with it, but uh, uh, we got locked out one time. Uh, during after after we did a uh, the docking test, the astronauts got out, and then we closed the hatch, and then they do a pressurization where they pressurize the cabin and it, and the lunar module because they're 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 tied together. The hatches are open inside between the two spacecraft. But when we went to open up the spacecraft after the test, we couldn't we couldn't get the door open, the hatch open. Oh, wow. Uh, we put a tool in on the outside, and we can turn it, you know, kind of clockwise to undo the latches. But what happened was, I don't know if he can point to this, this lever right here. Gary, the lever on the left-hand side, the gray lever. Yes. It has a... a Correct me. No, keep coming right down. There, right, 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 uh, right, right, right there, right? No, uh, the cylinder. There. The, the cylinder. cylinder on the left-hand side. See the side. long handle? Keep, uh, now come straight, straight up. up, straight up. Straight, keep going. The gray handle, right? The, there you it, go. A little bit. Okay, that's a lever. It has a unlatched, neutral, and latched. And what happened was, if that latch, Tex had pointed out to us, hey, we're having a little problem when we put it on unlatch. I mean, in a neutral position to close the hatch. Sometimes that thing latch wiggles over to the latch side. And when it did that, we we're working against the dogs, and we could not. It had slipped over, and so we couldn't go in there and try to oh unlock it. Oh my gosh, what'd you so, do? Well, we couldn't go in the lunar module. There's no way, absolutely at all, you just, it wouldn't support a, a weight of a person in there, and there was no way to get through the, to the door or the, on the front of that. So we were locked out. So finally somebody, one of the techs says, hey, we put, opened up the, the uh, pressure relief valve, and we took a coat, well, basically a coat hanger. No way! Yes, and we went in there, and jiggled the, the latch to the neutral position and then we were able to open it. And <laughs> wow. we, we reported it and we wanted to have a fix. And lo and behold, they did another test two days later and it happened again. And so that time we, we, we recovered very quickly. And but you still had the same wire hanger yeah, to get in there? and, and had to get it back in there. Is that right? And then for Apollo 16, uh, fifth, six, it must have happened probably on 15. Probably 16 uh, and 17, they had modified that handle where we could put a small clevis pin in there to keep it in that one position. Hmm. And that's the only ones that uh, like that. Well, there, of course, is the, uh, the lunar uh, the command module and the service yeah. module with the. And now we we had <laughs> an that'd be a, uh, Al Warden orbiting in that the late Al Warden. This is Apollo 15. <laughs> this is Apollo yep. 15, and uh, we had an extra bay that was never used and t towards the end so of the it was program. never used in the uh, up till that okay uh, 15 I th it may have been 14 15 they started putting experiments in there uh -huh. and uh when they got you know when they were going to the moon they blew the panel off and then they exposed the experiments and this one experiment in there was a, was a gamma ray telescope and i do have a slight story about that um we were installing it in the onc building and Herman Bryant was the technician that was going to do the job. His supervisor was standing behind him. I was off to the other side of him. And in front of him and, and closer to the experiment was the scientist who, who it was his whole life. Okay. And we're installing and they're getting ready to put it in. And the scientist says, you don't touch it, I will do it. And the technician, Herman, says, look, I, I, I know you want to do this. But you're not allowed to touch the hardware. I will do it for you. And the scientist got really upset. And he started to talk bad about the company and the people that were working for him and they were mismanaging this. And Herman, I could see him, he was face was turning red. <laughs> and he's a big guy. And I stood next to him and I watched his balled up his his fist. 
and he just started to start to swing, and the supervisor caught it, and then you know said it's all going to a break on a break, and then he left, and then we sat there and talked to the scientists. Said, look, this guy is a very good technician. You can count on him, and it says you do not sit there and badmouth them or give them a hard time. Oh my gosh! And you need to calm down, and you need to apologize. And he says, well, I've worked on this. This is my whole life. I, look, I got a divorce over it. You know, this is my, my claim to fame. I don't know what university he was with. But it ended up, he got, he got some kind of an award for it. Huh. What a wonderful story there from Gary Allgaier there to oh, keep you staying curious to come back because you never know what we're going to talk about. Oh, I got lots of stories. Completely there. unscripted yeah. here, of course. Uh, there you are again. Uh, this doesn't show up very good. This is Apollo 17. Uh, yeah, there's a seven. Oh, boy, you went all out with a cardboard box and some red tape there. <laughs> yes, it, it, it's a spare of the moment. Uh, you yeah. know, the photographer came up and said, hey, let's take a picture. And somebody said, well, this is the last one. we got to have some way to know it. And <laughs> so they put that up there. Until, until on the left side uh, of the picture there is, is uh, Jeff Hedges. He's, he's an operations guy. He's NASA. And then, of course, Mike Wiedemann from Rockwell was on the other side of us. That's 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 fun. That's good stuff there. Yeah. That's good. Look at that sign, folks. There. Hey, uh, you know. I wish it, it didn't have a reflection yeah. on, but that's what it is. And there's a recovery, of course, in the yes. Pacific Ocean there, uh, and most of them did land. You might wonder, or if you don't know much about the program, what those. Uh, uh, Airbags or balloons are about. Why don't you tell them, Gary? There, in case the uh, when it hits the water at an angle, if it doesn't rewrite itself, the the, the bags come out and they will actually force the capsule to turn upside right side up. Mm -hmm. That's what they're for. And most of the time they did. Some of these are out of sequence. Here we're yeah. trying to jam a lot in. Now here. this here well, is that's the docking collar there. Well, this is a very unusual situation. Uh, I think twice we had to take the forward heat shield off. Uh, Houston would give us a call and say, hey, we have an issue. We need for you to take that thing, uh, the heat shield off and to verify. One time we had to verify a rigging of the, uh, the parachute you can see there. And another time was with the harness uh, for the mortars that uh, fired the uh, pilot chutes out. Hmm. This is something I didn't like to mess with because that's, you know, that's a life type thing. If, yeah. this, if we screwed up and the chute didn't work, then you know, we lose a crew. There's a lady in a pink blouse next to the crawler. Yeah, that's my wife. That's your wife. All right. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. Good. Always good to get the wives involved yeah. in work there. Yeah, it was a special day. And there's a, another picture of a command module. This is, this is a Block 1 uh, command module. This is what was flown on the, uh, Apollo 1. Okay. This, in fact, I think this really is the Apollo 1 spacecraft. Uh, right. The umbilical that we saw earlier is in a different location, and again, this is back. That's yeah, okay. Wait, just keep going. Man. This is back at Downey. This is how they, you know, they were lowering the heat shield. I mean, the outer skin back onto the interior of the uh, command module. Yeah, but you got a guy on top up yeah. there. You got one, two, three, yeah, four, is, five, six, seven guys. This is back at the right. factory. Uh, Same thing. You can see there. the tunnel. Just thought it'd be interesting to show people yeah. how these things are. Or layered after layered there. That looks yeah. like David Scott. And, it's uh, David Scott, and there's a reason for the picture, but I don't know if we've got the time to talk about it. Sure. Go ahead, Gary. Um, this is Apollo 9, and the story is that uh, Jim McDivitt was the commander, and Jim McDivitt, whenever he flew anything, always, since he's Irish, had something oh, green right. yes, in, yes. The, in the cockpit. He had to have something green in the cockpit, the yeah. great Jim McDivitt, who just turned... 92 years old, oh I my. think. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the, the, one of the engineers for Rockwell came down to my office and said, ask for a, a special favor because he says, we need to change these. He, there's four levers that, that they uh, use to adjust the angle of the couch, the pans and stuff like that, and a little knob for the, head, for the headrest. And we were gonna change out the gold anonized ones that are on his couch to green. And so we negotiated uh, a, a trade on some parts so that I would sign it. And then we had to go down to, uh, and present it to our quality people who questioned it because it wasn't legal. 
and we finally were convinced them that they could. They Commander had Jim McDivitt yeah. wants some green in his spacecraft. Well, he doesn't. He, he doesn't ask for it. This is something yeah. that people put in for him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, the, instead and of painting anything, they green ionize. It's anodized, anod it's anodized green, and that, you know it came from the plant. And uh, I was trying to capture a picture. It gets fine. It's very very hard to see, especially on this format. Yeah. Uh, the, it's actually I, a knob to the yeah. on the left arm yeah. below. Uh, uh, Basically, I yeah. wanted to verify that we actually flew it that way, hmm. and then I did trace down where the spacecraft is, which is in San Diego Air and Space Museum, mm -hmm. and I was able to confirm that they're no longer there; that they're back to the original gold anodized. So I'm hoping that Jim McDivitt yeah, was him. the one that it, it retrieved them. Wow, that'd be a good question yes. to ask. Well, we can't talk about Apollo without throwing in a little, a little bit of the little lunar little module, module Grumman there that Marty Winkle yeah. worked on, and and there is the lunar module. And what stage is that in? Well, it's it's uh, being yeah. moved. It's probably getting ready to be put into the altitude chamber, or it may have just come out the altitude chamber. The landing gear is not on. Uh, that's why I know it's going to go to the altitude chamber. Mm -hmm. And then after it goes out. Of comes out of that then they sit in another stand and I think to put the gear on the landing gear on it and then fold we're, them. Lo <clears throat> we're looking at quad four it looks like there Marty mm -hmm. would that be right no, it looks like three three, three? okay yeah. open is three. <laughs> which is amazing is for 15 on on they put that little rover in there yeah there's another they're putting the slaw over yeah it's been set in the lower section of the slaw and the gray area you see there is a, is a hatch that we will remove when we get it to the pad so they can get access to it. Okay. And Marty, that's the, that's the hatch that you went through to get access to the lunar module, right? Yeah. Point to, point to that circle that. Marty, you're welcome to chime in there. And he, he's kind of, uh, I know this is all good memories for him, too. Yeah. Look at that. That is the hatch that you went through, Marty, at... Uh, 300 or 200, what, the 200 and 326 foot mark, you thought. And we had other, another two panels that were emergency that we had cookie cutters that if there was an emergency, it would fire some ordnance and it would cut a hole into the side of the slaw. Really? So people could ev evacuate much quicker. Wow. That was used during tanking. Huh? During tanking. Yeah. During it wasn't active before that. Wasn't, okay. Okay. These are just pictures of, these are pre-Apollo, basically. Yeah, people uh, don't, don't see these kind of pictures yeah. very often. Now, this the is whole... a real picture. You can see the landing gear, the landing uh, struts from the lunar module sitting in there. Yep, sure. I see the ladder there, yeah. uh, Marty. Uh, you just get a, get a glance at the ladder. That's yeah. kind of a cool picture. And one of the things, they, they covered the whole thing in a big, you know, protective cover, which I really didn't understand why we did that, because... It set out at the pad without it, but for for months. But we to go from the VA to the O and C building to the VAB, which is a th three or four mile drive. Uh, they would put this cover on there. Mm -hmm. There's your pass. This is my 17. pass. Uh, I brought it down here when he had uh, the museum was having a. Uh, guy come in to buy off some of the souvenirs, mm -hmm. and he ended up. I had my patch. My, this is my, this is Apollo 17, the last one. This is my area access badge, badge that you always had to ha have on you. And some gentleman bought it on eBay, and I did get a letter from the gentleman who traced me down and wanted to know what the numbers meant. And so I responded by telling him what it was. And so he he honored me by putting it in his trophy case. Oh, and sent you a picture. Yes. What do the numbers mean? Oh, four, seven, eight. I don't remember exactly what one, three of them are, are they're either to say you have access around the, the, the service module. Okay. Uh, and the other ones are access to certain facilities, like I could go to the pad, I could go into VAB, certain levels, O and C. And so those, those were access codes to allow you to be around the vehicle. Hmm. All right. And there's Gary again with... Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I'm quite honored because I didn't ask for this picture, but uh, uh, Mitch, Ed Mitchell, he said, would you come over? I'll let you take a picture with me. So, oh. so I was quite honored for that. Well, we've enjoyed talking to Gary here. I've got, he told me a couple stories uh, before at our pre-production meeting there a little bit. 
that I want him to share to take us out, and I'm going to have the rocket here. Uh, uh, and we'll do that. There, there we go. Um, you told me about push back the shake the shake test, uh, and and we're going to talk about twang. Okay. Uh, the push. The rocket bend in the shape you're saying there, yeah. <laughs> yes. So tell us, this is this is amazing, folks. Really. There is a YouTube video out there, I, and I'm sure I think it's the the first vehicle that was ever taken. A pad was not a real launch vehicle. It was called a verification vehicle. 500F. Yes. Very famously. And you know how you know the difference of that, Gary? How's that? There is a black circle around oh, okay. the uh, service uh, command module, module on the slot. That's okay. how you know that was. Yes, they took a dummy out there to the pad. To yes. just, it, you see a lot of photographs of that because okay. uh, it's a beautiful day and all that stuff. Yes. Well, anyway, they, um, they have a video out. It's about a minute and a half long. And what they did is they wanted to shake the Saturn V. For, uh, I think it was to, to watch the swing arms go in and out and, and see how they work because they were supposed to follow the spacecraft. And so what they did is they got some guys up here in the VAB that sat on their on the floor and put their feet up against it and then started pushing. And at the same time, they had some guys up here with some ropes tied to this that were pulling, and they were in sequence. And they got this thing to start swinging back and forth, back and forth, and there's some video of that, uh, which is quite interesting. It's just some music. There's no... Why were they doing it? I think they were there to check the swing arms to see how they track. Oh, there, I got you. There is, a pit, there is a video picture of them of the swing arm going in and out. Um, the shake. The the, the 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 thing about our design people, design engineering, they uh, never really get to talk to the actual design engineers back in in the manufacturing plants. So they go based on some other information. And they always came up with these really, really crazy, the, and the vehicle's going to be moving this much in the wind. And, and like I said, we never, ever, ever saw that. But they, they always designed to it. They even did it on the shuttle. And he said, look, we don't see that. What we see, and I, I told you before, is when we're up there and the platforms are around there, there's a gap around, you know, the, the diameter of the opening is greater than the diameter of the spacecraft. Right. And you could follow the sun when you're inside there. There's no windows. And the sun hitting one side of the vehicle and the other side not would cause the vehicle to, to bow. To bow? The actual Saturn, Saturn V structural? Yeah. And you'd go up in the morning. Outer surface. You'd go up in the morning and the, it'd be maybe a, two inches closest, you know, away from one side of, the, of that platform. Uh -huh. And it'd be an eight inch gap. And then when you go back in the evening, it would be just the opposite. It'd be a two inch huh. gap. And that was really the only movement. Now, we did see some movement if somebody was in the cockpit in the crew module and they started sh doing a lot of activity, we could get a little bit of motion huh. out of that. But that was that was basically it. And the twang, twang test was... Uh, now, the twang test, okay. Yeah. This was Apollo 6 where they did this. Now, before, when... when uh, uh, so, tell the twang is most noted in this shuttle where the SM, SSMEs, when they fire, they push the shuttle forward, yeah. and then when it comes back, the twang zero, they go well, up. That's be, so yeah, what they're are we talking about with yeah. the Saturn V? The Saturn V was <clears throat> what they wanted to do. Basically, they were trying to calibrate the tie-down post. Okay. So what they did is, in the VAB, is they came up here, and they, the launch tower was not on at the time, and they, where the tower attaches to the command module, they put a post in there, and they grabbed it and they pulled on it. They pulled it over a good foot, and then they just let it go. And the, anyway, I just I was there to see this, and it just went like this and stopped. And that's how it, that was a twang test. The that whole caliber, Saturn V rocket yeah. weighing all those millions of pounds, yeah. and you're up there sticking a... Well, there was no fuel in it, so yeah, it's, well. it wasn't weighing quite as, quite yeah. as much, but uh, it, it, they're more flexible than you think. Huh. Well, Marty knows that because he's been up there in the slaw yeah. on a windy day. Right, Marty? Yeah. Yeah, I'll guarantee you there's movement. <laughs> Marty says, I'll guarantee you there's you, movement. You want to talk about the fins? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. Uh, and here's our rocket here. Yeah. Um, we've enjoyed this conversation, Gary, and I hope you all have too. I've heard some stories I never heard before, 
And that's what's so great about being at our museum. You yeah. come here, and you're always going to hear some <laughs> stories from these national treasures here. But yes, we've got fins on here. And Gary asked me the question, why are there fins on the Saturn V rocket? And, and so I'm thinking it's a trick question. It probably doesn't have anything to do with the aerodynamics. Maybe it has something to do with the photography of it or something. So you tell us, Gary, why are there fins? Uh, the, the designer of that was Werner von Braun. Werner von Braun, and yes. And he, he said all rockets have to have fins. They don't build a rocket without fins. So anything that Werner von Braun was associated had fins on it. They didn't provide anything to the other than they were a scar weight that really didn't, you know, you just carried them along for nothing. And because he was the grand designer of this, yes. nobody overruled him. That, oh, you uh, couldn't overrule him. There will be fins. <laughs> that's right. He was fins. I mean, you know, that's a, that's a, I never heard that. I never really drew attention to the fins yeah. there. Because I asked but him. By golly, I'm going to look at him. I see him down there on yeah. the picture we have on our green it was the screen. the first time I was out at the pad and I was walking around. I said, you know, why were you got fins on this thing? Because you know, your atlases didn't have fins, your deltas didn't have fins. Now, the S4B had fins because he worked on it. Yeah. Well, let's put her back here in our place okay. here. And, uh, uh, Marty, we got any comments out there or questions for Gary Allgaier here? No, no questions. Just a lot of good comments. Just, you know, enjoy good. the show, enjoy the speaker. Yeah, I have thoroughly enjoyed this, Gary. Is there anything I've we've talked about that we you'd like to talk about that I didn't have not asked you? Oh, uh, there are so many questions. Uh, I mean, stories. Uh, Apollo seventeen was the most memorable, memorable launch. Uh, I always had the fortune uh, to be in the right place at the right time. And unknown to me that for all the Apollo missions, JSC uh, Houston had an engineer come down and he would fly with the Air Force Re rescue team. And uh, for Apollo, and what they were gonna do is transition out of that position and I was selected to pick up that position for the three Skylab missions. And so what I did was I went on a training mission with them while they did their training for that particular flight. And what we had is we, uh, I don't know if how many people were familiar with the Sikorsky HH-53s. It's the biggest helicopter that the Air Force has. It's used in, in the, I think it's a sea stallion for the Navy. Mm -hmm. And we had three of them, and each helicopter had a physician in it. And we would go, and we'd be on it, and the, each helicopter had suspended under a unique item. Ours that I flew on had the... Uh, Fire, the uh, rescue of uh, the uh, medical kit it was suspended underneath it the next one had a, a fire suppression kit and the third one had an extra uh, toolbox type kit and what they let us suspend it and then we would go out when they on launch day they go up to mosquito lagoon and they go into a racetrack orbit oh. and they always had one helicopter pointed at the at the launch pad as we went around and they supported and what they were there for is if the it was an abort they would they had the navy dive air force divers on them and the, each one had a surgeon and then they would get, either jump in the water or if it was on the land what i was supposed to be doing is if the hatch was jammed i was to help them the t the, the the divers to get in either there or through the upper hatch that wow. was that was the position that i was on but again on this particular mission i was in the training for apollo 17 since it was a night launch they had another helicopter coming it was a huey and they took out the clean out the you know, inside interior except for the pilot and co-pilot they put a small i was told it was a jet engine but i'm not sure that was right and underneath of it they they suspended a huge xeon light Oh, wow. And this light was so bright. And when I, you know, we, we practiced with it at night. At 3,000 feet, you could read a newspaper. Wow. And at 1,000 feet, it would melt asphalt. A xenon light on this helicopter yes, would on melt asphalt from 3,000 yeah. feet. Yeah, I talked to a guy feet. later wow. that, that flew in Vietnam. He said, yeah, we used those over there in Vietnam during the Vietnam huh. War. So that night... Uh, I was positioned at the end, out at Play Linda Beach. I was 2.7 miles from the from the uh, pad A, mm -hmm. and there was a landing zone. We had a, a, a command post, and I was stationed there as as a backup case. You know, 
something ever happened. And uh, the helicopter was this helicopter with the Xeon light was up, up above us on, over Mosquito Lagoon. The three other helicopters were there. And we're sitting there, we're getting down into the count. It, it, personally, I looked down the beach and I said, you know, there's nothing keeping me from running down the beach and be right underneath of it as it goes over. But I figured it's not worth my career to do something, <laughs> something like that. Yeah. So uh, we were sitting there. It was getting late in the count. I think we were less than, than uh, I mean, maybe two minutes left in the count. And we got a call over the uh, loudspeaker. It says, everybody clear, the, cl run front, get clear. Run away, get out of the landing zone. And he said, we got an emergency. And I said, you know, what's going on? So I turned around, looked up the beach, and here come that Huey helicopter flying maybe five feet over the dunes, throwing out this huge, long trail of sparks. It looked like a big spark, you know, thing. And it came in, and it landed. As it landed, we hit T-Zero. Oh my gosh! And at the crew, as soon as it hit the, the, the touchdown, the engine quit, and the pilot and co-pilot got out and kissed the ground. <laughs> and I was that was between. You're watching this. Yes. Yeah, uh, well, see, I'm standing here. The helicopter and the crew is down on the ground, and there's a Saturn fight. It lit. It, it lit off, and it just put that all in, in perspective. It was so beautiful. Wow. And what I wish a dramatic I a, story. I there. wish I was a painter so I could have reproduced that. Yeah. But it was just it was just a tremendously uh, what scene. a memory. What and a the, memory. And the, Fifty say, years ago in December yeah. that happened. And then uh, the problem was we were supposed to call a hold because of that and we didn't get we didn't get it through in time. So if we had called a hold, we would have probably not have launched for another month, probably. Oh my gosh, that is a heck of a story there. Yeah. Gary Allgaier, yes. thank you so much for sharing that story with us. Mosquito Lagoon, I was stargazing up there last Saturday at Biolab. Oh, okay. The Biolab yeah. boat dock, right? That's yeah. up there. Yeah. And they call it Mosquito Lagoon for a reason, folks. <laughs> uh, yeah. You could barbecue them mosquitoes up there. I'm telling you, you could skewer them like that shrimp. They're, yes. they're wild yeah. up there. Well, Gary, thank you so much. It's what, been a pleasure welcome. to yeah. get to know you. What great stories you've got. We're going to have him back uh, more about the uh, shuttle here and here. I'm going to push our rocket button here mm. to Nine. take us out of here. Eight. We're glad that you've all been watching us. Five. Five. Four. Three, there we two, go. One, zero. Launch commit. Lift off. We have lift off. All right, we have lift off. Marty, thank you for all you've done today. Gary Allgaier, what a pleasure to be here. What a great State Curious program. And as we launch off again, half a century later, I'm Mark Marquette telling you to come back tomorrow. We're not having Triple T. We're going to have an ESA. Uh, a young engineer that is working on the lunar outpost. So until then, we'll see you tomorrow to bridge the space between us.